I'd like you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Last week we finished chapter 8, which uh, got into things offered to idols, but that was only a uh, symptom because the real issue was whether or not to do something that would cause your brother to stumble. And back in verse uh, 9, it says, But take heed, this is chapter 8, verse 9, Take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. And the word liberty, of course, was exousia, which means your exercised authority. So you're to watch that your exercised authority, which is the freedom that you have to utilize your power and to do certain things in the body, because all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. That those things do not become a stumbling block to those that are weak that would cause them to go back into their former idolatrous practices. And then in verse 13, he concludes, Wherefore, if meat or anything else, television, booze, you name it, whatever fits into society today, if meat make your my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend or to leave the body, to go back to idolatry. It's not a matter of whether he's just offended at what I say. It's a matter that it would cause him to leave the body and, and go back into idolatry. Then chapter 9, he opens with a question. Am I not an apostle? Matter of fact, he opens with four questions. Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? Now, first of all, the word apostle and the word free are interchanged in many of the um, Greek manuscripts as well as the Aramaic Peshitta text. And I believe it should be that way, that it starts out, Am I not free? Then, am I not an apostle? Because that ties into the next statement. Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? And to see Jesus Christ was a requirement to be an apostle, one who had seen the Lord Jesus Christ, one of those requirements that Dr. Werbel has, has listed on a number of occasions. So it should start out with the phrase, am I not free? I'm free to eat, to drink, those things that are offered to idols, anything, but not if it causes my brother to stumble. But otherwise, I am free to eat and drink. I'm free to do other things. And it's not just food. Like I say, that's an example. But it would apply to anything in that category in our culture today. Am I, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? And of course, all four of those are the figure of speech that you've become very familiar with, erotesis. It's a rhetorical question. As a matter of fact, in this chapter, there are 20 questions. 18 of those 20 questions are rhetorical questions, expecting a yes or no answer. Only two of them are otherwise. One is in verse 10, where he turns around and answers the question. And the other one is in verse 18, where he doesn't answer the question till later on, as I'll show you. Now, are not ye my work in the Lord? The people at Corinth were the result of the Apostle Paul's work. He was an apostle to the Corinthians because he brought them new light. New light to that generation, to those people. Maybe he wasn't an apostle to certain other groups like at Jerusalem, but he definitely was to those at Corinth. And that's what he's getting to, establishing in his apostleship. This word work brings to mind 1 Corinthians 4, or chapter 3, verse 14, where it says, If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, 
he shall receive a what? A reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now Paul brought new light to the Corinthian people. They were born again. Is that work going to stand in the gathering together? So is he going to be rewarded for it? Certainly. See? That's why I think just that word work in chapter 9, verse 1 is so tremendous. Are ye not my work in the Lord? And it's a work for which he will be rewarded in the future. Now verse 2. If I be not an apostle unto others, Yet doubtless I am to you. He may not be an apostle to other groups, like I said, at Jerusalem, Palestine area, Babylon, but he definitely was to those at Corinth. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. The Corinthians were the seal of his apostleship. They were the proof that he had brought new light to Corinth. Because they were born again. They spoke in tongues. That was the seal of his apostleship. And of course, seal, that's the same word that's used of the seal, like the signet ring, where they would place the stamp on a document with the sealing wax. You know, you put the signet ring on it, and that seals it. It ties it in. It's a mark or impression that's left by the seal. And it shows the authority of the document, because only... The master or his steward had that signet ring in the Eastern culture. And these born-again believers at Corinth were the seal, the authority, the proof of his apostleship to the Corinthians. Verse 3, Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. The question has turned from what you do that makes your brother go back to idolatry to another question that people were examining Paul. And, of course, the word examine is anakrino, A-N-A-K-R-I-N long O, which you're familiar with by now. It means to examine by investigation. You remember uh, chapter 2, verse 15, that, he that is spiritual examines all things by investigation, yet he himself is, is, is examined by investigation by no man. If you're spiritual, you can examine, but you in turn are not to be examined by investigation by anyone. And the examining is what precedes the judgment. This is not crino, it's the anacrino, the examining that takes place before the actual pronouncement of a judgment or sentence. Paul was not abusing his freedom as he was accused of. They were accusing him. They were examining his life and accusing him of abusing his freedom. When in reality... The ones that were abusing freedom were some of those at Corinth, Corinth that were examining him, that were causing their brother to stumble, to go back to idolatry. But Paul was not abusing his freedom. As a matter of fact, in this that follows, he points out his in his answer that he even restrained himself from certain privileges which were rightfully his. He restrained himself from certain privileges that were his by right. The word answer is the Greek word apologia, A-P-O-L-O-G-I-A. And it means answer. Same as the Aramaic word. No, it means more than that. It's an answer of truth in the face of accusation. 
an answer of truth in the face of accusation. It's not an apology. It's not apologizing for what you believe. But it's an answer of truth in the face of accusation. When someone accuses you or examines your life, you answer them not to defend your position, but to tell them the truth of what God's word has to say about your life. You never have to defend the word. The word is its own defense. You just speak the word, but your answer is this word apologia. It's not a defense, but it's an answer of truth in the face of accusation. There were believers at Corinth who were being critical of the apostle Paul as this points out. And chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians is his answer of truth in the face of accusation to their criticism. Verses 4, 5, and 6 answer in brief the accusation that Paul had abused his freedom in three categories. Number one, the use of physical things food and drink representing that it says have we not power to eat and drink number two relationships with others verse 5 says have we not power to lead about a sister a wife as well as other apostles and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas and the use of church funds Abundant sharing. Or I only, verse 6, and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working? Paul's life was an example to follow, not to criticize. He had already written by revelation to the Corinthians about his lifestyle in chapter 4 and in verse 16. He says, wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me, not examiners. Be ye what? Followers, imitators of me. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, my ways, Paul's ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Paul had told them, be imitators of me, of my ways. But instead, many of them were examining and criticizing him. Paul's life was given as the example to follow regarding eating things offered unto idols, he told them in the last chapter. In the 27 verses of chapter 9, the word I, I, that's spelled I, <laughs> not E-Y-E, -E, I, appears 35 times. The word I appears 35 times. Now, that politically is not too good to do, but uh, it's the word. And there's a reason for it. It is, it is appropriate that in this section, between chapter 8 and chapter 11, on the abuse of freedom, and things offered unto idols. Right in the middle of it, here in chapter 9, the life of the Apostle Paul is given as the epitome of the balanced walk. That's why I, 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 appears so many times. His life was the epitome of the, of the balanced walk. It was neither legalistic nor Lacentius didn't go one extreme or the other. Rather than follow Paul's example, however, some of the Corinthian believers had accused Paul of the very things of which some of them were guilty, abuse of freedom regarding the use of physical things, food and so on, the relationships with others. What about chapter 7? What about 5 and 6? And stewardship which is covered in chapter 4. So 
<coughs> all the way through here, it covers Paul's correction among the Corinthians of the things they accused him of all the way through chapter 8, then chapter 9, the answer to the accusation against him. Up until this time, chapters 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, he dealt with their problems, but they were accusing him of some of these same things. Now he gives his apologia, his answer of truth in the face of accusation. Isn't that beautiful? The believer has freedom, but the law of love demands that he serves and is temperate in all things. If he does these things, he will not be rejected from the competition, as we'll get to as we go to the end of this chapter eventually. Now, verse 4. We're going to look at his apologia, his answer of truth in the face of accusation. Have we not power to eat and drink? It's a figure of speech. What? Erotesis. Right. It's a very erotic chapter. <laughs> rhetorical. <laughs> 18 rhetorical questions. And by the way, most of these expect a yes answer in Greek, the way they're constructed in Greek. Also, this eat and drink is an idiom, meaning that stands for the enjoyment of all kinds of pleasurable activities, not just food. The word power is exousia again. I thought of Romans again, tying it back into the doctrinal treatise, chapter 14, verse 4. Romans 14, verse 4. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Who are you that judges another man's servant? Who are you that judges me, the Apostle Paul? Then we get down to verse 13. He says, let us not, therefore, judge one another anymore. Let's not judge one another. And that's what they were doing, was examining Paul. But judge this rather, that no man put a what? Stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. That's what chapter 8 was all about. Instead of judging whether something would be a stumbling block causing a brother to fall, they were more concerned with criticizing, examining whether somebody else was walking right according to their customs and their vision and so on. You see the difference between judging one another and judging whether something's a stumbling block that causes somebody to go back to his idolatrous practices? <coughs> if you set you know, a bottle of of uh, bourbon in front of uh, an alcoholic, a former alcoholic. What's it going to do to him? Well, sure. See, it's just something you wouldn't do. But if you have a bottle, or if you have a bottle, <laughs> if you have a drink, and I see you have it, and I say, boy, you shouldn't be drinking, and just start criticizing you for it, that's what he's saying. Let's not be judging one another. But let's judge this, that if you do something that causes a brother to go back into his old ways that are contrary to the word, then it's wrong. Matter of fact, chapter 8 said it was a sin against Christ. But not whether you drink, have a drink or not, or whether you wear lipstick or other things, <laughs> and yet that's what so many people get down on, is customs, practices. They don't like your customs, and that's how they examine you, take you apart. It says, don't we have authority to eat and drink? 
to enjoy certain things in life? Well, sure. You've got to enjoy something once in a while. You know, all work and no play makes Johnny a dull boy. It's not in the word, but it's still good. Chap Verse 5. Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife? And the word wife is also woman in both Aramaic and Greek. It can mean woman. Um, in other words, just because this sister happens to be a woman, can't we lead her about? Can't she travel with us? But what you want to do, you want to read something into it. You want to say, well, I've been out shacking up with her just because she travels, because of your gutter mind. Have we not power to lead about a sister, a woman, as well as other apostles? Other apostles were able to enjoy that privilege. And as the brothers of the Lord, and Peter, Cephas, Cephas is his Aramaic name. Peter is his Greek name. Both mean rock, little rock. And then his other name was Simon. But this is his Aramaic name, Cephas. You see, these are the brothers of the Lord are given in Matthew 13, 55. They are James, Joseph, Simon and Judas, four brothers. And they were allowed to lead around a sister as a, as a woman, a sister, a woman. And in Galatians 1.19, it tells us that James was one of the apostles, the Lord's brother. And on the day of Pentecost, it says they were among the about 120 that were present, not the day of Pentecost, before the day of Pentecost, when they were waiting. In Acts 1.14, his brothers were present with the about 120. Now, again, that's a rhetorical question, verse 5. Verse 6 is also a rhetorical question. Or I only, and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working, to go without working? You mean we've got to work all the time, but those others don't have to work? Now, this is the issue he really works on in this chapter. In verse 12, for others be partakers of this, if others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Then verse 14, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which pre preach the gospel should what? Live of the gospel. Verse 11 is good too. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we reap your carnal things? See that? It's dealing with living off of the abundant sharing that came from the people. The apostles were the Lord's brothers, others that ministered to the body, Cephas. Don't we have power to eat and drink, to enjoy a few things? Don't we have the authority to have a sister to go with us when we travel from time to time? And don't we have the power not to work at times because the abundant sharing is available so that we can give ourselves to the work of the ministry? Well, sure. And again, it's an erotesis. If you remember in Acts 18, 1 and following, when Paul went to Corinth the first time, what did he do? He worked. He stayed with, uh, what's their names? Aquila and Priscilla, because they were of the same occupation. And he worked with them. He worked when he was at Corinth. He did not live off the abundant sharing. But he worked while he was there. 
Now, he didn't always do that, but he did at Corinth. And it's real interesting in light of this particular chapter. But he's pointing out, don't we have the power or authority to forbear working, to go without working, you know, at a job, saddle making? Verse 7. Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? This is, again, erotesis. There's three of them in this particular, particular verse. Who plants a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth the flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Now, it's real interesting. The Greek, of course, is goeth a warfare or to serve as a soldier. But the Aramaic is from that word palak that you've heard before, and it means to labor. Who labors in service? Any time at his own charges. That's the Aramaic. Who labors in service? Any time at his own charges. And that fits much better with the other two things that are in the verse. Who plants a vineyard? Who feeds a flock? Who labors in service? Tell me which fits better with planting a vineyard and feeding a flock? Laboring in service or being a soldier? Laboring in service. You bet. It introduces the other two ideas. Laboring in service is the overall descriptive thing. Then it gets to specifics because there's many different types of service that you work at. But specifically, planting a vineyard and feeding a flock. And if you plant a vineyard, don't you eat the fruit of that vineyard? And if you feed the flock, don't you get to drink some of the milk? Sure. See it? Again, three rhetorical questions in that verse. In other words, if you work the word and teach the word, minister in the gospel, then you ought to be able to eat off of that. That's what he's saying. He's building toward the principle. Now, verse 8, two more rhetorical questions. The first one in Greek expects a negative answer. The second one, a positive answer. Say I, the, I these things as a man. In other words, if it's expecting a negative answer, you might word it in English. I don't say these things as a man, do I? Then the second one expects a positive answer. Or doesn't the law say the same thing, huh? <laughs> expecting a positive answer. Yes. Again, two more of those rhetorical questions. I'm not just flipping this off the top of my head. I'm not just saying this as a man, am I? But the law says the same thing, doesn't it? Haven't you read this in the law? Then he backs it up. He quotes them. From the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 25.4, this is a gnome, G-N-O-M-E, a citation, figure of speech. And verse 9 has it, that quote from Deuteronomy 25.4, says, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. And the word corn is omitted in Greek and Aramaic. However, you know, in, in biblical, or in, in English, I think it's still true today, corn means English English, not American English. Corn means grain of any kind. It's only in the United States that corn means that yellow stuff on a cob, I believe. It's maize in, in England, isn't it? Maize, and in German it's mites, something like that. But anyway, it's not even in there. But that's the only thing they would tread out is grain. 
<laughs> Doth God take care for oxen? Does he? Well, there's another erotesis. Okay. Now, verse 10. Or saith he it altogether for our sakes. Now, that is not an, an erotesis. It's not a rhetorical question. It's just a question. The reason it's not rhetorical because he turns around and answers it. He doesn't just expect an answer without, you know, in other words, you should know this. Well, he turns around and tells you what the answer is. Or does it, the, saith he it altogether for your sakes? For our sakes, no doubt. He answers the question. That's why it's not rhetorical. This is written. That he that ploweth, whoever plows in the field, plow in hope. When you plow in the field, why do you plow? Because you hope someday you are going to have something to eat off of that field. Right? If you plant a garden, you hope, and hope is for the future, believings for the present. But your hope is for the future is just as strong as your believing for the present but it's for the future because it's not yet available. So when the farmer plows his ground, he has to hope for the material to come that he can eat. <laughs> he can't believe for it yet. It's not yet available. He plows in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope because when he threshes, he gets the th Stuff off the field, it still has to go through all that treading, you know, where the <laughs> ox tread upon it and knock all the chaff off and everything, and then it has to be winnowed with the winnowing fan, and, you know, worms might eat some of it in the meantime, and the wind might blow something away. But then finally you get that pure grain, and then you can eat it. And when it gets to that point, that's when you believe and eat. Until that time, it's hope for the future. Well, but he still has a right to eat that. That's a principle of life. It's in the book on lifestyle of the believer. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we reap your carnal things? Rhetorical question. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? If there's other people in the fellowship, leadership or whatever, who are partakers of your abundant sharing, shouldn't we, the ones who first Gave you the word? Never, nevertheless, we have not used this power, this authority, but we allow all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. The word hinder in the Greek is used of cutting a trench in the ground means to cut in, literally. Because you would cut a trench in the ground to slow the enemy down. And we don't want to slow the gospel down. <laughs> That's why we don't want to cut in. We allow all things, lest we should cut in the gospel of Christ, lest we should slow it down. That's why we didn't live off your abundant sharing when we came to Corinth. What did we do? We worked. We made saddles. We worked so that the ministry could move, that the gospel wasn't hindered. Then verse 13. Do ye not know, 
And again, we have a rhetorical question. This is one of those don't you know questions. Don't you know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers of the altar? If you're going to work in the temple like the Levites did, you were partaker of those things. Even so hath the Lord ordained or commanded is both the Greek and the Aramaic word. It means to command or to order. Even so, and this is the conclusion of all this that he's been talking about. He's been drawing, making illustrations, quoting from the Old Testament. But now he draws his conclusion. Even so, the Lord commanded that they which preach the gospel should what? Live off the gospel. It's not just a maybe, but the Lord commanded that if you work the gospel, preach the gospel, you should live off the gospel. Now verse 15. But, but, but sets it in contrast. A very important word at this point. But I have used none of these things. I did not live off of your abundant sharing. What did I do when I came to Corinth? I worked. I made saddles along with those other two, Aquila and Priscilla. <laughs> I worked. I have used none of these things. Neither have I written these things that it should be so done unto me. In other words, I'm not writing this letter so that now you start sending me your abundant sharing so I can live off of it. I didn't live off of it when I was there, and I'm not writing these things so that now I can start live off, living off of it. Then... The latter part of verse 15 is a parenthesis. It's an added explanation, but it's incomplete without the context. And that is, for it is better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. Because Paul worked wherever, well, not wherever, but at Corinth and other places, he worked when he traveled. He made saddles at a job, secular job. But he also preached the gospel while he was at it. And he did not live off of their abundant sharing at that time. And he's not writing to get them to do it. That's why his glorying, and the word glorying is boasting, his boasting was that he was able to do it. That's something he could boast about. He says, it's better for me to die than that some any man should make my glorying or boasting void because I can boast about it because I did it. Now, Paul had a right to live off of the gospel, right? Just like the other apostles, like the Lord's brothers, just like Cephas. But did he? No. And he says, I'm not writing to you so that now I can start living that way. Because then you would take away my boasting. This is real neat. This is his answer of truth in the face of accusation. And you remember what I said? He did not even claim some of the rights that were his. One thing is he could have lived off the gospel, but he refused to, at least for the Corinthians, because... Then he couldn't boast to him. Verse 16. And verses 16, 17, and 18, I have not seen a commentary or a translation that really handles these three verses correctly. And I'll do my best. And I think in the context, if you watch the context, it's talking about abundant sharing, yet Paul refused 
it at Corinth anyway, because that would cut into his boasting. There's a real significant point that he's trying to get across here. Verse 16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. The word glory again is boast. If I got paid, then what could I boast of? Nothing. But, you know, if you get paid for preaching the gospel, can you boast that, boy, you make it available freely? No. You just make it available. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For necessity, necessity is laid upon me. I have to preach the gospel. Whether I get paid or not, I would still have to preach it, right? Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. And the word woe in Greek is ooi. O-U-A-I. Ooi. Only I bet they pronounce it more like wah! <laughs> Because it was an interjection. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. In other words, Paul had a responsibility for preaching. But in the context here, it's even bigger. Because if he took that abundant sharing that was rightfully his. If he was paid for doing it, it would be his responsibility to preach the gospel. But when he doesn't get paid, he has the joy of preaching the gospel and he's not under obligation financially to you. He's only under obligation to whom? God, see? Now, verse 17, and that word necessity in 16 is very important. Necessity is laid upon. Now, verse 17, if I do, for if I do this thing willingly, and that word willingly has been a problem, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Sounds like, he, either he could preach the gospel willingly or he could do it against his will, which just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Because you'd, if you do something against your will, you'd have to be possessed, I believe. The word willingly, the word willingly, in Aramaic is B-S-S-E-V-Y-A-N-I. B-S-S. E V Y A N I. And it means in my desire. In my desire. Greek is hekon, spelled H E K long O N. Hekon. Now, this word has been given numerous meanings and translations. <laughs> I'm going to give you the meaning of it, and then I'm going to show you a couple other things. It means advertently intentionally, purposely, with desire. Advertently, intentionally, purposely, with desire. It's not by constraint, compulsion, or necessity.
if you are constrained to do something, or it's of necessity, as we read back in verse 16, or you're compelled to do it, then you're not doing it purposely out of the desire of your heart and intentionally or advertently. The word, words against my will, see that? Is just the opposite. Um, the Aramaic is spelled D L A. Then the next word, V S S E V Y A N I. And it means not in my desire. The Greek is A-K long O-N, akon. And it's just the opposite of hekon. So it would mean inadvertently, unintentionally, not out of desire, but of necessity. Now this first word in Greek, hekon, hekon, which means advertently, intentionally, purposely, is related to another Greek word spelled H-E-K-O-U-S-I-O. Long O S. Hakusios. That word is used in Hebrews ten twenty six and first Peter five two. I want you to look at Hebrews ten. 26. This is a related word. Has a very similar meaning. 1026. It says, if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. If we sin intentionally, advertently, purposely, with desire. See it? It's more than just a willingness. <laughs> it's intentional, on purpose. See? Now, chapter, uh, I mean, First Peter 5, verse 2. Talking to the elders. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, taking the oversight of the flock as elders of the flock, not by, what? Constraint, but willingly. Advertently, intentionally, purposely, with desire and heart. See, not, be, not of constraint, or out of necessity, or because you're compelled to do something, do it because you love it. Now, let me ask you a question. What would compel you to preach the gospel? Huh? Money. Money. Yeah. If you got your paycheck, then you would feel compelled you had to do the job. Then you do it because you have to. But Paul was saying, if I do it not because I'm compelled, but intentionally, advertently, purposely, with desire, out of the greatness of my heart, it's impossible to really show what this word means in just one word. But out of my heart, 
then I have a what? A reward. But if I do it not out of desire, and I think that Aramaic is great because it really capsulizes it, the desire of your heart, but the Greek word does too. It's inadvertently, it's not out of your desire, but it's out of necessity that you do it because you're paid for it. Then an administration, oikonomia, is simply entrusted unto me. I have the responsibility, the stewardship of doing this administration. It's just a job. Isn't that terrific? I mean, it's <laughs> the, the, what the verse says. Two ways to go. One, I just do it out of the greatness of my heart. The other, I do it because I'm paid to do it. Until something comes out of the greatness of your heart, it's really not going to bubble and, you know, it doesn't mean you can't get paid because he just gave the argument that you have the right to live off the gospel. And so you could get paid and still do it out of the greatness of your heart. But if you just do it because you get paid, then it's not so good. All you've got is a job, a stewardship. In in uh, Luke chapter 17, Luke chapter 17, oh, verse 7, 17, verse 7, but which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him immediately, when he has come from the field, well, say, servant, why don't you come and sit down and have some meat? No, 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 no. You know he's your servant. Will not and will not rather say to him, make ready wherewith I may sup. You know, he just came out of the field. What are you going to tell him? Well, why don't you sit down and have something to eat? No. What do you tell him? He's your servant. You pay him, right? You pay him. This is his job. What do you tell him? Well, make ready wherewith I may sup. And gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunken. And afterward, thou shalt eat and drink. Why? Because that's what you're paying him for, right? He's your servant. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I imagine not. Because why? It's his responsibility to do it. So, likewise ye, when ye have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our, what? Duty to do. We did that which was our duty to do. If you're paid to do it, then it's your duty to do it. But if you do it, Without pay, that's what Paul was saying. I did it without pay. That's why I can boast about it. And there's a what? Reward. That's ahead for me. There's a reward. Now the question is, what reward? Well, that's verse 18. What is my reward then? The only problem is they put the question mark there and it belongs at the end of the verse. The word verily, of course, is in italics. The word that is hina in the Greek, H-I-N-A, which introduces a purpose clause. In Aramaic, it's the letter daleth, just the what we would call the letter D. Both Hina and Daleth may indicate a purpose clause, which indicates the reason for the reward. And so it's all a part of that one question. This whole verse is a question, and it should read like this. What then is my reward, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel? Question. 
What's my reward then when I preach the gospel? That I may make the gospel without charge. That I abuse not my power in the gospel. You know what most of the commentaries have said? They said, well, the answer to the question is this second half of the verse. And I read it and I read it and I could not figure out how that could be a, an answer to this question. What is my reward? Oh, the answer is that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. That's my reward. And I scratched my head and got splinters under my fingernails. No, it's not an answer. It's part of the question, see? The words of Christ, of course, are omitted in many of the manuscripts. Now, the word abuse simply means to use in both the Aramaic and the Greek. The Greek also has a sense of using fully or completely. And that would be very appropriate in this verse because He's, he's asking the question, well, what's my reward when I'm preaching the gospel without any charge, I don't live off of the gospel, that I don't fully use my authority that I have the right to use in the gospel? I don't fully use it. That was his claim. Remember a while ago, I told you that at Corinth, his answer of truth in the face of accusation was not only did the Apostle Paul have nothing where they could complain about, but he wasn't even utilizing his full rights that he had, that he could have used. And here he says it. What is my reward if I don't fully utilize those rights and privileges, those authorities that I have, in that I preach the gospel, but yet I do not live off of the abundant charity. I do it without charge at court. What then is my reward for doing that? He answers that in verses 24 and following. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain an, a corruptible crown, but we a what? Incorruptible. That's the answer to that question. What is my reward? It's future. When Christ returns... An incorruptible crown. Now, verses 19 to 23 then are a paremboli. A paremboli. P-A-R-E-M-B-O-L-E. -E, which is an added explanation complete in itself. You put parentheses around it. You could take it out and read right from verse 18 to 24, and look how it flows, because it answers this question that he brought up in verse 18. And that's what they haven't seen. So 19 through 23 is this parambole. Let's read it. For though I be free from all, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Here he's explaining you know, why he does it without charge, that he doesn't fully use his power in the gospel. Instead, what have I done? I've, though I be free from all, I, I wouldn't have to do it this way, yet I've made my what? Self-servant to all, that I might gain the more. Under the Jews I became what? Judean. That I might gain the Judeans. To them that are under the law, as under the law. By the way, certain of the manuscripts add this phrase, myself not being under the law.
myself not being under the law. To them that are under the law, as under the law, although I'm not under the law myself, but yet I act like I'm under the law to those that are under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. Then verse 21. To them that are without the law, as without law. Then you have a parenthesis. Being not without law to God, but under the law, and that too should be of, of Christ. Many of the Greek manuscripts have to God and to Christ. Others have of God and of Christ. But the Aramaic's the best. It has to God and of Christ, which makes sense. The law of Christ was the law of love. In Galatians, he mentions it too. Chapter 6. Let me read it to you. Galatians 6, 2. Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And the law of Christ was to love one another and so on. Being not without law to God, but under the law of Christ. End of parenthetical statement here. That I might gain them that are without the law. I become all things to all people. Verse 22. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all, that I might by all means save all of them. Nope. Save some. Save some. I become all things to all people, that I might gain some, save some of them. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof. The words with you are not in anything, <laughs> except the King James. Okay, so delete it. That I might be partaker thereof. Of what? The gospel. Be partaker of the gospel. That's the end of the parambole. Now, verse 24. And this, as I said, answers the question of verse 18. What then is my reward if I do it all without charge, that I don't fully utilize the authority that I have to utilize in the gospel? Well, don't you know? And this is the 18th rhetorical question in the chapter. Oh, by the way, verse 18 was also one of those questions that was not a rhetorical question because it needed an answer, and the answer wasn't there, but now here's the answer. And the answer starts with a rhetorical question. <laughs> Don't you know that they which run in a race, they all run? But one receives the prize... So run that ye may obtain. And of course, this verse is lo loaded with athletic terminology. The word run is treco in the Greek, to run in a race, T-R-E-C-H-O, with a long mark over the O. The word race is the word stadion, S-T-A-D-I-O-N, stadion. It's a race course. The word prize I didn't write down here, but it's another word, bayon, I believe. The word, the stadion was 625 Roman feet in length, the length of the stadium in which the race was held. And so run, treco, that you may obtain. Then verse 25, and every man that striveth for the mastery, to strive for the mastery, that's the word agonizomai, A-G long O N I Z O M A I, which is to contend in the games, to contend in the games, agonizomai. Every man that contends in the games is temperate 
in all things, or he exercises self-control in all things. Discipline training. He exercises self-control in all of his discipline training in order to compete in the games. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. And of course, the crown was that wreath that was given at the different games. Um, at the Olympics, it was an olive wreath. Uh, at Corinth, it was made of pine, the Isthmian games that were run by the Corinthians. Remember, we talked about all that earlier. But that's an in, or a corruptible crown. We do it to obtain an incorruptible what? What figure is that? Ellipsis. E-L-L-I-P-S-I-S. -I -I Ellipsis. Where you omit the word, it's demanded there, though. You supply the word crown after incorruptible. Now this word corruptible can be used. I'll give you the Greek word. It's P-H-T-H-A-R-T-O-S. Phthartos. P-H-T-H-A-R-T-O-S. Phthartos. And it can be used of something physically corruptible or it can be something morally corrupt in an ethical sense. <clears throat> in Ephesians 4, 22... I'll read this to you. That ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is what? Corrupt. And there it employs the verb form. Is corrupt according to deceitful lusts. The old man is ethically, morally corrupt. See? In 1 Corinthians 15, you have another one. Be not deceived, verse 33, 1533. Be not deceived. Evil communications or associations corrupt, see the word corrupt? Good manners or morals. Your evil associations corrupt your good morals. Physically? No. Ethically, see? Corrupt your good morals. And then, in chapter 3, you remember the verse, if any man defiles, corrupts the temple of God, God's going to destroy or corrupt him. Ethically is how he tries to defile the body, because you can't defile the temple itself, but to destroy those members in it. God, in turn, is going to corrupt him. How? By his works. Destroying, I mean, his works will not last. They won't stand. He will not receive a reward for them. That's the ethical sense. And so, going back here again in the context, an incorruptible crown, we look forward to future rewards. The pay today. If you get your rewards or pay today, isn't that corruptible? I mean, it lasts as long as it holds out, and then it's gone. That's right. It's still in the corruptible category. So there's something even bigger than that which is available today. Sure, you live, preach the gospel, you should live off the gospel. You have that right. And if you do, don't overuse it or don't abuse it <laughs> see but on the other hand he was saying well there's something even bigger than that and that's our future rewards and even if you work for the way international for a paycheck if you keep your eyes on that paycheck and not on your future rewards you're never going to produce things spiritually like you ought to produce You've got to keep your eyes on the future rewards at all times. 
God supplies all of our need according to his riches and glory. It's not the ministry supplies all the need, and it's not the government that supplies all the needs. God supplies our what? Until, unless we keep our eyes on, on God and what, that he takes care of us, then we're not depending on God, we're breaking fellowship with him. We've got to depend on God and keep our eyes on his benefits to us today as well as the future rewards. When Christ returns, he'll reward us. Thought of that verse in Timothy that those that labor in the word and doctrine, you're to count worthy of double honor. Well, they have that honor today. You don't muzzle the ox as that same verse is quoted there. They're paid, sure. But what about future rewards? They have, du you know, double honor in that sense. Besides the benefits that go along just with the joy of serving today. If there wasn't joy in serving, who'd want to do it? But if you just do it for a paycheck, I don't see where the joy can be. You have to do it because you love it. Because you love God, your heart is into it. You're willing, what was the word? Out of, you know, out of your heart. The desire of your heart with purpose. Not just willing, but, but out of the depths of your heart. Terrific. In Greek athletes, athletics as well as the Roman time. After a period of time, they became corrupt. They started taking under-the-counter money in the Olympics and the other games. Prize money, bribery, and so on. And in the New Testament times, they had become quite mercenary in athletics. The same is true today in some fields where there's under-the-counter money paid to top athletes in some of these marathons and different things. So they will either produce, you know, they'll put that extra effort in to win or come in second or to lose or something. <laughs> See, That's, you know, was in vogue at that time as well. And that pay, that reward for them is corruptible. Even their little honor would have been incorruptible in that sense that it was ethically won. But if they did it for money, then it was ethically wrong. It was corruptible. So there's a lot more to this as you work it than just words. <laughs> just one single meaning here. There's a lot of depth to it. We do up to obtain not a crown or reward just today, just for pay today, but it's for all the spiritual benefits that go with it and the future rewards as well. An incorruptible crown. I therefore so run, so run, and again run is treco, T-R-E-C-H-O. Not as uncertainly, so fight I. And the word fight is to box. Not as one that beateth the air or fights the air. Shadow boxes. Or it can be, also be used also of the blows that you miss when you're boxing. <laughs> Where you don't make contact. But, verse 27, I keep under my body, or I suppress my body. Literally, that word in the Greek means, I give myself a black eye. <laughs> but in this context, it's referring to the physical discipline and hardship that a boxer endures so that he can take the blows of the adversary and come back swinging. I condition my body to hardship. Some of the ascetics took it literally. <laughs> However, it's simply an analogy 
To give yourself a black eye just means get toughened up that you're able to take it. You ever see a boxer? Boy, they get hit a few times in a night. They've got to be able to take it. So you condition yourself spiritually and bring it into subjection. Bring it into subjection is one Greek word. I'm going to give it to you. D-O-U-L-A-G-O-G-E-O. And put a long mark over both of the, or the last two O's. Now, that's a combination of doulos, which means what? Slave. And agoge. A-G, long O, G, long E. Which means training or discipline. So put them together, and it means to train rigorously under rigid discipline. It's quite a word. You give yourself a black eye. No. You condition your body to, to hardship and train rigorously under rigid discipline. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, is wrongly translated, when the herald is summoned, you know, when they blow the horn to announce the beginning of the race, I myself should be rejected or unworthy, disqualified. Rejected from the competition. And I don't think you can improve on Dr. Werwell's translation of this latter part of the verse. That in no way, having heralded the summons for the competition, I myself should prove to be rejected from the competition. That in no way, having heralded the summons for the competition, I myself should prove to be rejected from the competition. So you suppress your body or condition your body to hardship so that you're ready for the race. You train rigorously under rigid discipline like a slave. And then when they announce the beginning of the race by blowing the trumpets, heralding the summons, you're not rejected, disqualified, rejected from the competition, that you're able to run that race and win the race. But if you depend on corruptible things, if you just go through life and enjoy some of the things, but your heart's not really into it, if you do the thing intentionally with desire, with your heart into it, then there's reward. But if you just do it because you get a paycheck, because you have to, then you just have the responsibility of the stewardship, and I don't know how long that'll last because your heart's not really into it. But if you put your whole heart and soul, your discipline, training into it, then you're accepted in the competition. You're worthy to run the race. Then you run the race with all the gusto you've got and win it. And that's the way, the attitude we have to have if we're going to see the word reach over the world. We can't do it for pay. Pay is okay meets needs, but that's not why we do it. Why do people work so hard at General Motors? Because they get paid. Why do people work so hard here at Way International? Not because they get paid, because their heart's into it. Because they want to see the word go over the world. And if somebody does not have their heart into it, they don't last long. Your heart has to be into moving God's word over the world rigorously with discipline like the athletes trained for the the races, for the boxing matches, endured the hardships, 
They prepared. They got ready. See how this whole chapter is Paul's answer of truth in the face of his accusers. They didn't have a leg to stand on in accusing him because he was truly an athlete spiritually. He put his whole heart, soul, and life into it. He even went beyond what he was required to do because he could have accepted the abundant sharing at Corinth, but he didn't. Instead, he just kept preaching the word because he knew then he couldn't boast to him about it. And they weren't big enough to understand the principles. Maybe by the time 2 Corinthians was written, they were big enough that he could really start sharing with some of that. Because in chapter 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians, he really gets into abundant sharing. Tells them where it's at. But here, they just weren't big enough to receive it. And he just still had the joy of holding forth the word if he never got a paycheck. He made saddles on the side and still spoke the word. And that's the attitude and heart we have to have toward the word. Because we want to see the word move over the world and we're willing to put whatever it takes into it to see that it gets done. Because we've got rewards incorruptible in the future that we keep our eyes on at all times rather than on the reward today. Although there's benefits today that you enjoy along with it. So, during your ho-ho relo, get out there and hold forth the word because you got rewards coming. Do it, okay? Father, we thank you for this great night, for your love and goodness to us, for your wonderful matchless word, and for allowing us to again study your word and see how it works in our own lives and how we can apply it in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.